I'm not sure what day it was or how it happened exactly, but I somehow found myself sitting on my couch in the dark, elbow deep in a party-sized bag of nacho cheese Doritos. My relationship with food is complicated. I wish I could tell you I ate only one serving, which is 12 chips. But that would be a lie. The rude serving size printed on the bag is a recommendation anyway, right? A joke, really. The truth is, nobody expects anybody to eat only 12 chips. So I put the TV on and Doritoed my way through two episodes of Sex and the City. In one episode, the red-haired Miranda, the Dorito-haired Miranda, gets so fed up with herself for binging on chocolate cake one tiny sliver at a time that she throws it in the trash to save herself from it. And a few seconds later, she rescues a piece from the trash and eats it. Then she pours dish soap into the trash for added protection against the cake. I sat there with my orange dusted fingertips, disgusted with myself. Not with Miranda, no, I 100% got Miranda. <laughs> I too was a binger. Once to force myself to stop eating french fries, I squirted copious amounts of ketchup over them. And then, fearing I would still eat them, with a fork, of course, I'm not a total barbarian. <laughs> I unscrewed the pepper shaker lid and dumped every last grain of pepper onto the blood red pile of danger. I wish I had that kind of determination to destroy perfectly good Doritos, but I do not. <laughs> no, I'm the girl who voluntarily participated in a guilt-inducing food orgy with 192 baked then fried crunchy corn triangles. I am the girl who consumed 2,200 calories of chips in less than an hour. And let me tell you, it was a total mind fuck. I clicked off the TV and went to the bathroom to throw up. Was this rock bottom? Chip bottom, perhaps? Me ending up on the linoleum next to the toilet, trying to undo what I had done? The idea of sticking my face in the shitter to retch on purpose only intensified my shame. I had to draw the line somewhere. And for me, that line was the rim of the toilet bowl. I should have felt proud I couldn't make myself throw up, but instead I felt like a failure. In 2012, on my wedding day, my maid of honor speech started out with how happy she was for me and my new husband. But somewhere along the way, it turned into a roast. <laughs> this one time at the beach, she said, Leslie yelled at a toddler for eating her Doritos and she sprinted after him and pried the bag from his little fingers. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I stifled the urge to cry as my throat burned. I sipped from my wine glass as my hand shook, threatening to spill Cabernet on my dress. I wanted to grab the mic to defend myself. I did scold a two-year-old for sticking his grimy mitts into the bag because it was unsanitary. And also, he was being so selfish, fisting my chips like they were the last bits of food on earth. Where were his goddamn parents anyway? And actually, it was an infernal, greedy seagull that absconded with my Doritos. And you're damn right I chased that thieving seabird down. And I won. <laughs> so what if I was embarrassingly protective of my Doritos? I'd also spent decades burying my trauma so people wouldn't see it. My best friend should have given me a heads up that she was going to cut my secrets out of my chest and throw them to a banquet room full of people. 
then, I could have encouraged her to highlight my tenacious spirit and stellar athleticism <laughs> instead of focusing on my desperation to recover a $5 bag of empty calories. For those of us who have suffered from food insecurity, what most people think of as a funny story about what happened with food that one time is a humiliating, searing insult that lays bare the weakness and self-loathing that circles the core of our existence like a vulture. When I was a freshman in high school, I would come home from basketball practice and eat a half a bag of Oreos before dinner, stopping only because of shame. And at some point during my senior year, I started eating Reese's peanut butter cups every day in third period, a habit I might not have remembered if it weren't for my AP English teacher announcing it to the class when she presented me with an award at the end of the year for eating the most junk food. She laughed. My classmates laughed. Hell, I laughed. It was the only way to keep from crying. I was a scholar athlete who hadn't missed a single assignment and got A's on everything. But it seemed Mrs. Doyle would remember me for my Reese's. Maybe my toxic relationship with food began much earlier like when my foster mom's friend said she couldn't believe my foster mom let me have a stomach like that. I was 12. I had never thought of my stomach as a thing to be judged by others. I had never thought of my stomach as anything more than the place where food died and where grief and fear lived. I was promptly put on Weight Watchers. My foster mom signed up too, so we could do it together. <laughs> we substituted pretzels for chips, and we limited sweets to one item a day, and we dieted. But the only thing I lost was any remaining love I had for myself. The addiction spiraled when I was 16. I would drive 30 minutes to pick up my brother, who had moved in with our grandparents after his adoptive mom-to-be died from breast cancer. We bought candy at the drugstore and sat on our grandparents' back porch, talking about nothing in particular. We definitely didn't talk about where our mother was or if we missed her, or if she might try to kill herself again, or if she missed us, or if we remembered the night we hid in grandpa's closet because mom tried to make us put our heads in the oven. I unwrapped my gold box of 40 miniature Reese's peanut butter cups. I'd eat one, savoring it, secure in the knowledge there were 39 more. I'd close the box, open it again, eat one more, close the box, open it, eat, close, open, eat. This was how I distracted myself from the fact that so many days had passed between my brother and me. We seemed more like strangers than siblings. Food was easier to swallow than truth. So I completely disconnected from my body as my mouth became a machine and I mindlessly popped candy-like pills. When it was over, I had this mound of little brown wrappers and an empty box that seemed more like Pandora's than mine, more like a chest of guilt than gold, because I had unleashed misery and evil, and it was my fault, and all that misery and evil was now inside my gut pit of shame because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I bet it began when our mom stabbed herself in front of us when I was eight. And when my brother and I went to our first foster home, the floors were so creaky and cold, I thought my feet would freeze off in the middle of the night when I got out of bed to sneak into his room so he wouldn't be alone. And when mom wasn't allowed to see us anymore, my brother and I routinely walked to McDonald's to eat Big Macs and large fries and two soft serve cones each. And we joked about how we were gonna need someone to roll us back to our grandparents' house because we were too stuffed to walk. But it could have started when we got caught stealing food from the grocery store because mom slept for days and we had nothing to eat but powdered milk with ice cubes in it. The manager called the cops, who made us put everything back, the milk, the eggs, the apples, and sent us home with a warning and told us to be good kids. 
It might have started when we were sleeping in parks and shopping at liquor stores for meals after going more than 18 hours without eating. Now, starving like that is trendy. It's called intermittent fasting. And people do it on purpose. But in 1982, when I was eight, eating Pepsi and Dorito dinners, it meant I had lost the ability to distinguish between stomach hunger and soul hungry, hunger. So I was always hungry, even when I was full. Our mentally ill mom loved us, but she also dragged us through southeast Los Angeles County on foot for weeks at a time. So I escaped reality through Doritos, as if by eating every last crumb, I could clear space for myself to climb into the bag and come through the bottom of it to another world. Doritos taught me food was more comforting than my own mother. Taught me that by ignoring my body's hunger and fullness cues, I could ignore fear and the emotional cold that came with it. My overeating became a symbol of the frightening decisions I had to make as a child and the aspects of my childhood that were out of my control. I turned to food as a surrogate mother because there is so, something so comforting in that mouthful moment that it's the only thing that matters and it makes me feel as if I'll never be lonely or sad or scared again. But then, when the chewing stops, it's the silence that gets me. The abject terror that comes as I realize I've done something horrifying and undoable, and the whole world will know it just by looking at me. That's when I'm truly alone. I eat when I'm stressed, scared, sad, happy, excited, confident, bored. And then I catch myself praying for caloric rewinds from a God I'm not sure exists. I hate food, and I love it. And that is why I'm tortured by it. But it isn't my fault, no. Food should be wrapped in crime scene caution tape. And instead of an ingredients list, Food should come with a skull and crossbones symbol. Peligroso, danger. Proceed with extreme caution because what you're about to do will layer you with a lifetime of self-doubt about your worth, your weight, your size, your reliance on stretchy pants, and your precarious internal argument about whether to ask the flight attendant for a seatbelt extender. Parents should come with danger warnings too because home is where a child's self-image first blossoms or bleeds. All my life, my narcissistic food has goaded me into a push-pull nightmare romance. Those damn Doritos, they're like my ex, and I didn't know they'd be at the party. But there they are, <laughs> seemingly harmless and nonchalant in the corner, next to the tray of jello shots that never properly firmed up. <laughs> they want to get back together, but I avoid eye contact as I try to convince myself they're nothing more than a salty snack. But if I'm being honest, I miss the codependency. Sometimes I wish I could break up with food for good, but I know that if I do, I will literally die. So it's not an option. And if I change my relationship with food even a little, I'm terrified I will no longer know who I am. Because who am I if I'm not begging food to love me? Leslie Ferguson! <laughs>